Obviously, I'm sure you've been thinking about doing a movie for a little while. Um, how much did you debate what you wanted to be for your first project, knowing that, you know, it's a really big deal what you take on for your first movie? Yeah, totally. There's, the, there's absolutely that thing in your mind of like, you only get to make your first feature once, right? And uh, and being totally honest, I think if you told me your first feature is going to be a whodunit, uh, I would have said, oh, are you sure? Because I wouldn't have like considered myself a huge fan of the whodunit. I like the genre and, uh, you know, was a, a big fan of, um, you know, murder mystery novels in my youth, but it wasn't something I was like itching to make. But when I read Mark's script and saw that it was both a murder mystery, but also a film that's about murder mysteries and the way that they function and the tropes that they rely on. Um, and also at its heart, a character comedy about these two unlikely detective partners coming together and whether they can come together and crack the case. You know, it was those things that um that got me excited about it and and felt like I could um could uh do it in a way that's hopefully uh, successful. Obviously COVID is the worst and it's the I mean it's terrible, but it yeah. did lead you guys to being able to use like these great locations that you would have never gotten otherwise. Can you sort of talk about that? Yeah, that was a, a strange silver lining to the whole process of filming during COVID was that we were able to film in some of these incredible locations in London um, that we would never have been able to get into to, to film at. You know, so places like the Old Vic, where we spent four or five days filming on the stage and in the auditorium, you know, under normal circumstances, you might be able to get in there for a couple of hours to to film something, you know, at the end of a day. Um, of course, it was bittersweet because the, yeah. all these theatres were, their doors were closed and we didn't know at that point when they were coming back and in what form they'd be coming back. But, um, you know, being able to contribute to them in that, in that, you know, by hiring them as a location during that period, um, was nice and it's really special that there are places like the old vic and the savoy hotel and uh, the dominion theater as well as um, a bunch of exterior locations in and around central london that we um have managed to to bring to the big screen and and, and uh yeah that I feel very lucky to have been able to do that yeah it's also what people don't realize is just adds so much production value you yeah. know for you don't have to build anything you're just using actual london is just you walk around the streets it looks like 1950 completely and there's a whole mix of that in this film there's you know pure straight up location work with a little bit of dressing you know to uh, or a bit of a uh, light visual effects to remove modern elements there's studio build stuff like um the one that stands out is mervin's apartment which which was an incredible studio build done by um, our production designer, Amanda MacArthur and her team. And then in the middle, there are my kind of my favorite, which is to find a location and then build into it to create a space that works exactly how you want it to work. And that's what we found with um, Scotland Yard, um, the police headquarters there, which was actually a kind of a school dining hall, this beautiful old uh, school dining hall with original features in on the outskirts of North London. And we were then able to sort of build in to build the office spaces and, and uh, put in the lighting that sort of really took you back to that era and created that kind of atmosphere. Um, so it was an amazing world to be able to create from a design point of view. I'm always curious about the editing process because that's where it all comes together. So mm. what did you learn from any friends and family screenings or test screenings that actually impacted the finished film? Yeah, we had a couple of um, preview screenings, um, the first of which in particular was really informative in terms of particularly when you have a mystery plot and you need to make sure that your revelations, the information you're dropping is is not too much, but enough. You know, um, if you don't see those breadcrumbs sufficiently, when the reveal comes, the audience feels shortchanged somehow because they wouldn't they don't feel they could have ever, you know, followed that thread on their own um and of course like equally bad is them getting ahead of the plot and sort of figuring it out well before you're ready to reveal it in your film so it was really really useful in terms of a bunch of fresh eyes to watch it and tell us when and where they were on to certain um certain reveals um that was that was hugely helpful the other thing that reshaped um 
after our first preview was the opening of the film we were always conscious that the first act or even the sort of um pre-first act of a murder mystery is a tricky period in the story because typically and in our film your detectives haven't arrived yet and when your detectives arrive and when they arrive in our film everything becomes clear in terms of like tone and you have a point of view and you have characters pushing you through the story so it was how to do the sort of opening before the detectives arrive before the murder has occurred how do you present the um introduce the audience to this world of characters um in a way that's economical but also feels like it has a point of view a clear point of view to it um and when we increased um the influence in that first in the opening of adrian brody's character um increased the amount of voiceover that he had in that and made him made the whole sort of opening circle around his character it kind of unlocked it for us and that was something that we we only found post that initial preview uh did you end up with like a lot of deleted scenes or a longer cut of the film or is it pretty much what we see no there was a longer cut of the film um mostly the things that haven't made it into the film were because we're from a story point of view i think once you in a thriller my feeling is once you get to a certain point whether that be the midpoint of the film or, or maybe into the third act um you're into what I would call the spiral then and everything needs to be accelerating and taking you forward and pushing you on and on and on. And so it was really in terms of that um, story economy and keeping it as sharp as possible and seeing scenes that we liked in isolation, but that were slightly repeating a story beat or circling the same thematic point. Um, it was... Um, I actually worked with two editors on the film and um, uh, started off with a guy called Peter Lambert who did incredible work and then uh, due to scheduling issues had to step off the film um, and um, Gary Dolner came on to complete the film. Now, fortunately, they had very much the same taste, had worked on very similar stuff throughout their career. Um, so that was a, an easy transition. But actually, it was great in that back end of the of the edit having um, Gary come in and and look at some of those scenes that I'm talking about that ultimately didn't make it into the cut with fresh eyes and with none of that um, sense of the the sunk costs that have gone into uh, you know you get attached to scenes because you know what they took to shoot, but also because you know what they took to edit. You know, to get this working really nicely as a sequence in its own right you you feel like you want to get in the movie if you possibly can so it was great having um, gary come in with fresh eyes and saying this isn't moving the story forward at this point let's see how it functions without it and you know it's non-linear editing can always go back in nobody's out with scissors and film anymore so um yeah it was it was great and um i always feel like a film's got a fighting weight to be honest that it's trying to get to and i always felt like this film would be at its best around an hour 45 an hour 40 minutes and it took us a while to get there but um but i i think it got to where it wanted to be as a story uh last thing for you real quick um you put together this great cast for your debut film um who was the person or two that you couldn't believe signed on oh my goodness i mean the list just goes on and on you know Sersha was the first person we went out to for constable stalker like she said yes then we managed to get sam rockwell to play Stoppard and the thought of those two together was enough that's fine we can have unknowns in the rest of the movie from that point on so then David Yellowo and Adrian Brody and Ruth Wilson and then the chance to incorporate some of my favorite um, British comic actors uh, into that ensemble it just means that right the way down that cast list um, there are uh, uh, incredible actors who i'm a huge fan was a huge fan of many of them beforehand and getting the chance to bring them all together and work with them in this um crazy ensemble was uh was yeah a dream come true uh yeah and as far as the scenes you cut out that's why they have uh, blu-rays that's why they have blu-rays exactly yeah, exactly exactly okay, that's um, why blue yeah <laughs> i mean look but seriously um listen yeah, i gotta yeah. stop um i'm just gonna say congrats on the movie i hope that um it's a huge hit for you and you're making something else soon thank you so much really appreciate the time really enjoyed this